going to now have a panel discussion with our award recipients about what you just heard from their journey to excellence. And this time, I'm going to remember to introduce the panel to you. So let me tell you that over here on my left, from Cargill Corn Milling, we have Ron Fiala, Process Improvement Manager, and Alan Willits, President, from Ardell Statesville Schools, I'm getting it, Terry Holliday, Superintendent, and Melanie Taylor, Chief Academic Officer, and from Poudre Valley Health Systems, Roland Stacy, President and CEO of the system, and Kevin Unger, President and CEO of Poudre Valley Hospital. We've got some more questions for you, so we're going to roll right on and get started, if that's all right with everyone. And we'll start out with a question. This is for the whole group. How did you build your leadership team and then change it as necessary to advance this journey to performance excellence? Who'd like to start? We'll I'll start. Um, we, we started with a team that, uh, this was 10 years ago, and some people were uh, more engaged in the process than others, and some elected to um, leave the organization as opposed to support the whole concept of of performance improvement, performance excellence, participative management, working with the employees. And, but that, that process was at the very beginning 10 years ago. Since then, as we brought people on, we've been able to make sure that they were engaged in the, the process as we, uh, most of the people who are on our senior management team today weren't here when it started but came knowing exactly what it was we were trying to accomplish. And so um, Kevin came to us from a, a consulting background, knew about the organization. We knew him. We knew he would fit in well. George Hayes came from St. Luke's, who had already received the award, so we knew that he knew about it. And over time, we were able to bring in people who we thought uh, would support and had demonstrated that they would be willing to support the direction the organization was taking. Terry? For us, uh, leadership team is basically the superintendent's direct reports, but what we try to do is uh, our weekly meetings, we try to bring in building administrators uh, to give us reality checks. Uh, uh, each of our leadership team members uh, is a category champion, and most have either been through state or national examiner training. And uh, the categories fall very nicely into their roles and responsibilities, so it was pretty easy to integrate uh, the way we do business. I guess probably one of the most pivotal moments for the change in our leadership team is uh, bringing on a, a, a key person, uh, Brenda Clark, out there, who had done this work in many locations. And I was able to save a couple hundred thousand dollars by changing her from a highly paid consultant to a poorly paid uh, school district official. So uh, thanks, Brenda. Thank you, Terry. Um, our leadership system is really driven by our strategic planning process. So part of our process includes a uh, very thorough analysis and roadmap relative to our HR strategy that will ultimately um, uh, execute and, and drive our, our strategic intent. And so as we, as we evolved from a um, plant-centric environment to an enterprise-oriented environment, then that, re that strategic change required um, a structural change and certainly a change in the overall leadership uh, focus. And so that was, that was the way we did it and we moved to a product line focused and then um, and there were different skill sets that were needed to, uh, to, to drive that that we could either acquire or develop internally. Great. Uh, this, this question was asked of Cargill, uh, Alan or Ron, but probably any of you could weigh in on this as well. When you, when you get one of the feedback reports either from the Baldrige program or your business excellence program, how do you decide what to work on next out of that feedback? We combine, the last few years we've uh, applied for both our Business Excellence and the Baldridge uh, Awards at the same time. So we're getting two feedback reports uh, simultaneously almost. So there's a lot of uh, OFIs and there's a lot of strengths that are uh, identified in both of those reports. So we combine all those together into a priority matrix and we go through and uh, rank the OFIs that we have been given 
by utilizing our values and our uh, mission and purpose. So we rank them against uh, those things and uh, prioritize them that way and then spend time with the leadership team deciding which ones we're going to actually uh, work on. We know we can't uh, possibly work on everything that we've got. And just for example, this past year, from both the Business Excellence and the Baldridge Award feedback, we received over 131 OFIs, and we can't possibly do all that with everything else that's going on. So we need to really drive it to the critical ones that we need to uh, improve the business and, and help us uh, achieve our strategy. So this year we've, we've identified three that uh, we're going to work on this, this year coming up, and uh, those are built into our, our, business, our annual business plans. This is a somewhat similar. Uh, maybe Kevin made this a good one for you. Now that you've won the award, um, you're going to have kind of a hiatus of Baldrige site visits for a while, which I, I know you're probably looking forward to, but what are you going to do to fill that void? Now that you're not going to be getting that annual Baldrige feedback, how are you going to decide what to prioritize and work on in your organization? Uh, we're going to first start by working on uh, uh, ruling jokes and see if we can... <laughs> We can come. Yeah, it was sad to hear everybody laughing at him because that just eggs him on. So we're, we've we've got we've got four years of, of listening to his jokes. On a serious note, uh, we're gonna um, continue to utilize our state program. Tom Morrow, uh, he's done an outstanding job. We we have a number of examiners for, at the state and the national level, and so we'll be doing internal assessments using our our, our examiner crew as well as. Um, We'll probably have some consultants come in and uh, just look at the organization, make sure we're still on the right track, continue to give us feedback on what we can do to improve. Great. Um, Melanie or Terry, you, you guys identified a number of lessons you've learned from looking at other folks. Do you also identify uh, best practices, lessons learned from within uh, the school system, and especially maybe from some of the more um, non-traditional academic areas like band or choir, athletics, anything along those lines? We have a process in our schools where our instructional facilitators come together and they meet uh, once, once a week and they share best practices out. They're in professional learning communities with teachers every day, so they're sharing best practices. We also have um, processes on our athletic teams where our athletic director, we have a head athletic director and they meet on a regular basis so that we're ensuring that those processes are carried out fully across the district. So they also work with other state agencies and really ensure that the processes and policies are followed. I think um, moving on into the national level, I think we're trying to work with several different organizations on benchmarking and benchmarking, uh, benchmark data uh, for internal school district processes, everything from instructional technology to how you hire people. And uh, I know a lot of the other sectors have this data readily available quite often, and school systems sometimes don't have the money to purchase uh, from uh, large systems, but one group we're working with in particular in Jinx, and we started learning about all this from previous Baldridge winners, was American Productivity Quality Council. So uh, a lot of work going on in benchmarking and uh, access of a database that would allow us some comparative data. Uh, Alan Run, what besides your leadership system did you work on after you got your first Baldridge feedback report back? We got a lot of good feedback, and, and one of the things that we didn't do a really good job around on our first Baldridge application was that we had not done a real good job with the results section, and, and, and that was the section that we scored the lowest in. And we spent a lot of time, uh, some of the feedback was around uh, getting comparative data, and so we spent a lot of time in the next few years making sure that we had good comparative data to use. And uh, another thing was that we didn't segment our data very well. So uh, we made sure that we were looking at it in a segmented format. Uh, so those are two huge things that we worked on. OK, great. Uh, this one, I, th I think, again, for everybody. How do you make all your employees feel that they're a part of the success that you've now gained by being a Baldrige Award recipient?
Uh, I think that's a bit of a challenge given the uh, economic realities that we're uh, facing. Um, and so the way that we've chosen to do that is uh, as part of our um, annual uh, senior leadership tour that goes to all of our facilities, uh, we had a, a, I would say, a fairly modest celebration. And so the leadership team um, got up early and uh, served pancakes and stayed late and served lasagna. And we just had a time to interact with all of our teammates and thank them one-on-one uh, -on -one for their uh, for their contributions, um, as well as sharing, you know, some of the opportunities that we see for future growth um, and reinforce the fact that uh, the uh, the award's fantastic, um, but it's really about the journey. Anybody else? We've done uh, similar. Uh, process to get our employees engaged. We, first of all, when we announced the award, we um, broadcast that uh, to our various locations and, and then um, have had several minor celebrations in, in our uh, different organizations to make sure that every employee feels engaged in the process. When we uh, receive the award, we're allowed to bring a team with us. We did a drawing to randomly pick people from the organization to attend the, the, the presentation ceremony with us, which generated a huge amount. Uh, we also are going to be having a, um, a celebration party, give each employee a memento of the occasions, uh, employee and, and staff member, physician, workforce member. So with the goal of recognizing that everybody had an equal part in this and everybody played an important role. And they were so engaged in the site visit and other parts. I think they know that, but we want to make sure that, that we don't recognize some more than others, and we're going to get, get the celebration out to everybody. I think they covered pretty much everything we're trying to do. I, th I think we're all waiting on the award ceremony, and then I think we'll very carefully uh, move the uh, crystal around to have little little uh, celebrations uh, with us it'll probably more, uh, be more uh, uh, coffee and cookies that's probably about all we can afford next year <laughs> okay great uh, well in several times you, you mentioned no more parallel tracks during your presentation folks would like a little bit of expansion what do you really mean by no more parallel tracks when I say no more parallel tracks, it's, it, it, I get asked a lot from organizations um, who are doing what we did in the early 1990s, and they would run their business, and then they would have their Baldridge application process kind of on the side. And you can never fully engage it, it, as long as you do that until your business becomes a Baldridge-driven business, and you use the criteria outlined in the Baldridge model to run your business, then you're doing your job and you're applying for the award. And those are two different things. And you can do those simultaneously if you want. It is within the realm of possibility. It will make you crazy. And it will drive your employees nuts. So the best way to do this is to make it the way you're doing your business. It's how you do business. And there are some, some identifiers to know if you're running parallel tracks. If you ask yourself, um, how much does it cost to run the Baldrige program, you're running parallel tracks. If you ask yourself, um, how much, what is, what is the expense, or the productive time, is it, do you count working on Baldrige as productive time? Well, it's your business. That, that's an evidence that you're running a parallel track. It has to be your business, and you can't differentiate. Both of the other organizations had, didn't use the same words, but you had similar ideas. Anything you want to add about how you really made it the way you did business? Uh, for us, I think probably the most concrete example is our, our, is our leadership system where um, we simply said, this is the way we're going to govern, this is the way we're going to manage, um, and, and it's very real for us, and we consistently communicate that. Um, across the organization, we have alignment with that, um, and so it doesn't look or feel like it's a bolt-on because it's simply not. And so, probably a key uh, a key point around that is just the opportunity that um, transparent and consistent communication will will um, 
will create that, that type of alignment so it doesn't look like a bolt-on or is a, a duplicative effort. I think for us in education, it was making sure that um, it was the way classrooms worked and the way students learned. And um, I thought we'd done a really good job with integrating and finally getting rid of that old question, how much are you spending on Baldridge? Uh, but at the day after we had um, been received the call from secretary about being a recipient this year, I was out doing my listening tour to, at all the school sites and they basically do question and answer. And the question came up, well, now that we've won this Baldridge award, can we quit doing this stuff? I said, oh boy, there, there's one of those thousand at the gate again. And I said, it was never, and I don't know how many times you've said this, but it, it's probably a million times now, it was never about the award. And we won't stop doing this stuff until we get 100% of the children to graduate from high school. I've I, I said often, I, I'm going to put up a thermometer like U90 way, how many days I've got left in the system and you know, 100% of the kids graduating, and whichever one y'all get to first, my contract or 100% of the kids graduating, you know, then you can quit doing this stuff. But until you get 100% of the kids graduating from school, we got to keep doing this stuff. Whatever you call it, it's called helping kids. So that's what Baldridge is to us. Okay, great. Uh, Ron or Alan, does the uh, Baldridge process help you compete more successfully? I would say yes. Uh, it, it, it has made us much more systematic uh, so that uh, our processes are very repeatable. Our employees understand uh, what their role is in, in utilizing the, the processes. So uh, w when you look at our results, we've had uh, incredible results in, in, in the uh, customer area, in engagement uh, of employees. Uh, and profitability of the company. So we've, we've had a lot of results that back up uh, uh, utilizing the Baldur's process. Um, I think it goes to the core of our strategy as well. So um, if you reflect back to, um, to uh, Ron's comments about our journey, uh, when we understood that um, one of the realities is that we have a distributed facility framework and so our competitive advantage would be uh, discovering, sharing, implementing best practices and you know that fits um, hand in glove with with Baldridge and so uh, the fact that we think that uh, we can create competitive advantage and have proven that um, is, is, I think, um, is, is pretty straightforward. Great. Uh, Melanie or Terry, one of the barriers that a lot of folks have pointed to in doing systemic educational reform has been the fact that you all have to deal with the negotiated agreement with your teachers. Has, how did that play into what you were able to do with the Baldrige framework? Well, in, in North Carolina, we don't have uh, unions that we have to deal with, but principals uh, still have a lot of opposition, and they, let's see here. The, the focus just has to be on what is best for children and improving children, and I think one of the things that Dr. Holliday did very early on is we have the NCAE, the North Carolina Association of Educators, and he brought them on board very early on and said, you know, okay, if this isn't working, then what can you do to help us, and let's work together to fix this and to move forward. And that was very, very important in our journey, to get them on board with us. Great. Uh, Kevin, we heard that um, your folks didn't cram for the site visit by the time you, time you got to the end. Does the staff at your hospital use Baldrige language on a day-to-day -day basis, or have you translated that into pooter speak of some kind? Wow, pooter speak. We haven't used that. Yeah. Yeah, that's going to get worked. I've copyrighted too. that already. By the way. <laughs> Bunny speak. That's what we. Use. That's what we use. Um, you know, at first, I think um, when we started the journey, I think that we did try to get staff to kind of use the Baldridge talk, and I think a lot of that was 
overcompensating for the fact that we didn't necessarily understand what, uh, what was in the criteria and we didn't have a great depth of knowledge as to what the criteria was asking us. I think after we started getting uh, people to examine our training at both the state and the national level, we started to kind of understand what uh, Baldridge talk is. And, um, and it really isn't dissimilar to what we do on a daily basis. It is our speak, basically. And so there isn't any real differentiation. We didn't cram, we did not uh, coach. Um, there was a complete ease going into our last site visit. So there was, um, we thought that we were gonna actually be a recipient two years ago. We had a, a great site visit and things went very well and uh, it just didn't work out for us. We now realize that the reason for that is we weren't ready. Uh, we weren't where we needed to be and I think the ease of uh, the last site visit really demonstrated that, that we were where we needed to be and we were um, worthy of, of this recognition. But it took us a long time to, to get to that point and I think that the speak that we speak on a daily basis, um, well healthcare mumbo jumbo is, is crazy anyway, but um, it, is, it is one and the same, the Baldrige talk and, and what we do on a daily basis. Uh, Alan, the folks would like to know, have you personally participated as an examiner for the business excellence process? And if so, how, how did you and the organization benefit from that experience? Um, one, of the, um, one of the processes or one of the benefits of, of our business excellence um, process is that um, we take uh, people from all across um, Cargill's businesses of all geographies and, um, and have them participate in site visits. And so there's, um, there's a couple of benefits of that. Certainly it's a, a great way to connect and, and bring in um, new ideas, new, new perspectives, uh, as well as to, um, to uh, borrow shamelessly from, um, from parts of their businesses that are doing things well. And so that's really, uh, I think, the, uh, the, the great benefit for, for a company like Cargill that does have a lot of different businesses, global, um, you know, how do you connect some of these best practices when everyone already has a kind of a full day? Um, and so the business excellence uh, site visits are, are really a great way to do it and an incredible um, learning experience, as well as the fact that we have a very, very uh, diverse team uh, that's involved in these site visits that, you know, you know how intense those things are in spending a week together um, and, 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 and really learning from each other. Uh, is a very, very rewarding experience and part of our development process as Cargill. Great. Uh, I think we'll make this the, uh, the last question for the group, and I'll open it up to all of you. I, I, I was interested in, in um, I don't think Simon Cooper really uh, sugarcoated it much for us this morning. Um, what, if anything, did you take from, from his presentation about the challenges that everyone is going to face in the current environment and how do you see that impacting what you'll be doing in the way of performance excellence in, in coming years? Well, I think we've been living it in education um, and every day there's something new coming down the pipe. Um, we were already a pretty low funded school system, so we gotta keep improving our efficiencies. But what it tells me is uh, he, he laid out plan, evaluate, scenario planning, uh, budget, improve processes, don't forget about your core competencies. You know, I heard from his speech this morning that Baldridge is more important than ever. So I think what we do is we go back and make sure we're nailing our core competencies. We make sure that we're focused on children. We make sure that we keep working on support processes to find efficiencies and economies of scale. And we look for innovation to help us save money. We're already having conversations with all of our vendors, with all of our suppliers. Can we renegotiate contracts? Can we save money here? Can we improve efficiencies? And uh, I think now is probably one of the prime times for us to move more quality initiatives into education because they need it more now than, than we ever have. I was impressed by um, Ritz-Carlton's ongoing process to evaluate what other opportunities they have and to not necessarily just sit back and and accept what's happening and it's through their 
their ability to um, evaluate the situation, make changes, and and continue their cycles. They're they're out making an argument to the public, as we heard this morning, that meetings are valuable. People come to share thoughts. The meetings like this, uh, we don't come to these meetings just to have a good time. We come to share knowledge and to learn and to grow. And people oftentimes from the outside think everybody's here and we're all having a big major party this morning, which you are, just listening to us as a party, I understand, but it's the wrong, wrong um, message that gets across. And they're going out proactively to suggest there is benefit to this, there's benefit to society, and if we stop doing this just because people are looking at it, then we'll lose that benefit. And I, I love that they're finding new ways to reinvent themselves as they go forward using these processes, and we're going to do that in healthcare and find new ways to be successful going forward as well. Great. Um, I had um, three takeaways personally. Uh, one is that I would think organizationally, if you would say, uh, who's a very customer intimate organization, you would probably name Ritz-Carlton. Um, and, and given that, there could be a real tendency, perhaps trap, to say, well, we know our customers. You know, gee, we've got it figured out. And, you know, it was startling to see how quickly the uh, value drivers for their customer base has shifted. And, um, and they, they didn't sit back and say, we know, we know our customers. We know what's going to happen. No, they went back and really uh, were very proactive in terms of understanding how, how the world had changed and how they would need to uh, anticipate and lead in that new environment. And so I think that's a great reminder to all of us that... Uh, um, you continually uh, question your assumptions because they may no longer be valid. Uh, the second point I thought was, uh, was pretty relevant was around the importance of transparent and candid communication. So, you know, going to 14 properties in five days and, and delivering a not so uh, pleasant message is, uh, is tough work, uh, but that's really uh, what leadership is all about. Um, and then the third thing, which was very relevant for us and that uh, core uh, community involvement's a core value uh, for us, something that we take very seriously. Um, clearly the same with Ritz-Carlton, and they've been able to frame it up as a as competitive advantage to drive uh, relationships with our customers. And so, you know, light bulb went on, see, boy, you know, we do a lot of this stuff. I wonder how we can do it uh, more hand-in-hand um, -hand with a lot of our customers to not only uh, strengthen and reinforce our core value, uh, but also to strengthen and reinforce um, our relationships with our partner customers. Okay, thank you. And would you now all join me in thanking our panel for, once again for those insightful answers. <laughs> <laughs>